Well, number one, of course, you're going to have lead falling on all the croplands everywhere around the world because it's going to eventually drop out of the sky. So you're going to have lead contamination of the entire global food supply. And remember, one of the big side effects of lead ingestion is lowered IQs. So this is not only a way to dim the sun, it's a way to dumb down the population through global lead poisoning that simply could not be avoided unless you grow food in a greenhouse, which is extraordinarily expensive. To act is to deceive. And to deceive, one must forget oneself. Who are you? Every metamorphosis is demanding, but to become this beast, well, that requires a little extra kick. Aircraft making a condensation trail is very similar in many ways to when you go outside on a cold day and exhale, you create a condensation trail. That little cloud is a condensation trail. Now, if you take a two-mile walk on a cold day and you can turn around and you can see your condensation trail tracking all the way back for two miles, that's how crazy it is to think that what we're looking in the sky is actually condensation trails. That's... Contrails disappear. radiation management, geoengineering? Yes. Well, according to the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, chemtrails don't exist. And, and even though that they don't exist and they're not spraying the sky, they also say that in order to stop global warming, we absolutely mustn't stop doing it. Another example is the array of technologies often referred to collectively as geoengineering, that potentially could help reverse the warming effects of global climate change. One that has gained my personal attention is stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI, a method of seeding the stratosphere with particles that can help reflect the sun's heat in much the same way that volcanic eruptions do. If you have a covert operation, a cover for that operation will be provided. That's, that's the nature of a covert operation. All of the evidence indicates that it is very much a covert operation of the greatest scale that has ever been exercised on this planet and really in the history of, of humanity as far as I know. The, literally the atmosphere of the planet has been altered and it's a deliberate alteration of the atmosphere.
a global operation and it affects everybody and every living thing. Chemtrails go from horizon to horizon, they spread and they crisscross and they go next to one another and pretty soon the whole sky is cloudy and we don't know who's doing it, we don't know what it is they're putting into the sky, we think it's aluminum, borium and strontium but we don't know for sure, no one talks. They can't do that in the sky above us without the provincial and the federal government being aware. The introduction of massive amounts of pollution into your atmosphere without your consent and without proper disclosure. Is that acceptable to you? Is that acceptable to your children? Solar radiation management methods, which you could also call sunlight reflection methods, seek to reduce the amount of climate change by reflecting some of the sun's warming rays back to space. Preliminary research suggests that we could rapidly and relatively cheaply put tiny particles high in the stratosphere. I welcome you here in the EU Parliament as a representative of the European Green Party, in my case as a representative of the German Green Party. With nuclear energy, with GM food, with geoengineering, they hope to save this planet. I think it always depends on an active civil society to reveal these things, to collect information, to warn of the dangers, to force governments to deal with this in honesty. And this experiment that has already been started, it is not that we only talk about research, rather it is already in use. The sky here is already being treated in a certain way. In conjunction with Harvard scientists, they've come up with a new project to pollute the entire planet. It's called SCOPEX, and it means Stratospheric Controlled Perturbation Experiment. SCOPEX, S-C-O-P-E-X, SCOPEX. Now, in this experiment, they take calcium carbonate and they release it into the atmosphere to block the sun. And this is supposed to stop global warming by blocking the sun. Basically, it's mimicking a massive volcanic eruption. Now, I don't know if you've read anything about the history of volcanoes, but there was a volcanic eruption, I think it was in the late 1700s or maybe the early 1800s, that caused so much dust to enter the atmosphere that it was, it caused food crop failures for two years. Okay, it was, it, I think it, it was even recorded as like the summer without a sun. Because if you put all this ash into the atmosphere, you kill the food crops and you cause famines. You cause the collapse of civilization. This is what Bill Gates is working on now. Again, it's called Scopex. Now, here's something else very interesting that you can only get right here from the independent media. Turns out, you know I run a heavy metals laboratory. I, I do a lot of research there. I release results all the time. But we've actually tested dozens of calcium carbonate products. You know, calcium supplements in bulk form, powder form, capsule form, and so on. Turns out that calcium is a natural attractor of lead, a toxic heavy metal. It causes lowered IQs, by the way. It causes brain damage and reproductive damage and cancer, all kinds of things. We have found, I think on average, 
between two and about eight parts per million of lead in all the calcium carbonate we've ever tested. Sort of cheap, low-grade, uh, mined out of the ground, you know, calcium carbonate minerals. This means that this Bill Gates project would be emitting not just calcium carbonate into the air, but lead. So he would be polluting the skies with lead chemtrails. So it's not just the aluminum and the barium and everything else that you're probably already familiar with. We are talking lead calcium chemtrail. Now, what would the effects be of this? Well, number one, of course, you're going to have lead falling on all the croplands everywhere around the world because it's going to eventually drop out of the sky. So you're going to have lead contamination of the entire global food supply. And remember, one of the big side effects of lead ingestion is lowered IQs. So this is not only a way to dim the sun, it's a way to dumb down the population through global lead poisoning that simply could not be avoided unless you grow food in a greenhouse, which is extraordinarily expensive. This would drop lead on the rivers, the oceans, lakes, and ponds. So there would be enhanced lead contamination of all the fish and seafood that you eat as well. At the same time, the calcium carbonate falling out of the sky would alter the alkalinity of the soils that it falls on. So now we're raising the pH of soils, which would deprive nutrients to plant roots because plants need some acidity in order to be able to assimilate nutrients. If you start messing with the pH of soils by raising the pH, what you do is you cause plants to absorb fewer nutrients and minerals. You cause many plants to be unable to produce as much food or as much medicine if they're herbal plants and so on. Basically, you're killing off the plant-based ecosystem of the planet. And at the same time as that, pay attention, this is, this is astonishing. You're dimming the sun. So you're shutting off photosynthesis or, or shutting it down. Photosynthesis is what plants use to generate energy. Without photosynthesis, you have no food crops. You have no food web. Every animal on the planet, which includes you and I, would die. And you can't escape it because, of course, you're breathing the same air. Everybody's sharing the same atmosphere. If it's falling out of the sky all over the planet, it's going to fall on your lawn, your food crops, your garden, your local farm. It's going to fall on grass that's eaten by cows that are dairy cows. So it's going to be in the milk that you buy at the grocery store if you're drinking milk. It's going to be in everything. Again, shut down photosynthesis by dimming the sun, alter the alkalinity of the soils to reduce nutrient uptake by plants, add lead to everything to lower IQs and dumb down human population while you're also collapsing the global food supply. And I'm, I'm trying to say this with kind of a calm scientific voice. I probably should be screaming at the top of my lungs here because this is this is the side plan for humanity. It's part of it. There are actually multiple layers to this plan. They're at war with the sun. They think the sun is bad and they want to dim the sun. They're also at war with carbon dioxide. They say it's bad, right? And they say they have to get rid of it because, well, they say carbon is, is a pollutant. Well, guess what? You're made of carbon. We're all made of carbon. And plants use carbon for this purpose. So understand, I, I'm really trying to drive this home with you, that number one, chemtrails are real. The chemtrails are going to be altered to now release lead, a toxic heavy metal, along with calcium carbonate. This is being run by Harvard scientists. It's already funded by Bill Gates. Again, the name of this is Stratospheric Controlled Perturbation Experiment, SCOPEX. They're going to be doing a pilot study right away with a few million dollars worth of uh, flights, you know, airplanes loaded with this, this toxic dust that they're going to release. And if that's successful, if they get enough money to do this, and that money will come from, you know, George Soros and Bill Gates and who knows who else, they're going to do this to the entire planet. So people everywhere, people in third world countries who can barely get by because they can't grow enough food to feed themselves, they're going to starve to death and die. And that's part of the plan. I'm going to talk about geoengineering, but I want to share a story with you. Every time I'm asked to speak, I, I'm a, I public speak for a living. Um, I'll go into that, but I don't get nervous to speak to you. What I get nervous about is not getting emotional telling you my story. Because in 2002, shortly after 9-11, like a lot of military veterans, I raised my right hand and I took an oath to the Constitution to hopefully do something meaningful with my life, you know, 19 years old, unsure what I wanted to do. So I enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. 
My job in the U.S. Air Force was working in bioenvironmental engineering. So what bioenvironmental engineering is in the Air Force is equivalent to that of the OSHA and the EPA, if you're familiar with that. So we were an embedded liaison to make sure that we were tracking all of the aspects and impacts of the military, meaning what is the military doing and how is it impacting the environment because we were accountable for that. Being government, we did not get any special treatment. We just couldn't be fined being another federal agency. EPA can't, but not OSHA. So from the health side, it was knowing what you do in the Air Force. What does your job entail that is hazardous to your health? And I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that you were an aircraft painter, you were a mechanic. My job would go out to make sure I knew everything that you did, what you were exposed to, and how to mitigate and engineer out those hazards. Because we needed to, one, it, it's your legal right to be working in a safe and healthful work environment. So throughout nine years, I worked as an industrial hygienist and an environmental specialist. One of, actually, there's two bases I was at that are called air logistics centers. What does that mean? It's not like a fighter wing, you know, it's not really fun and amazing. What they did is they took aircraft that around every 10 to 15 years, they were required to be dismantled down to the last screw. So that meant every single industrial process you can think about, checking the metal integrity, making sure everything's good to go, or sometimes overhauling equipment. Part of my job in tracking the health hazards was to look at any time someone wanted to buy a chemical, any type of chemical. It was ordered through a system, and in that system, I had to go in there and say, you know, the country we're in, we're not allowed to use this. We need to substitute it out with something a little less hazardous, while also maintaining the integrity for a technical order, meaning for that process, it says you must use, you know, xylene or toluene to do this process. Well, I have to kind of fast forward. I want to say around 2006, I started kind of opening my eyes to how the military wasn't really what I thought it was. And people approached me knowing what I did for a living and said, have you ever heard of chemtrails? Well, I hadn't. And that sparked my interest. So I went online and I looked at chemtrails. I saw a lot of, you know, debunking, a lot of sites that were just kind of calling it a conspiracy theory. And I thought, well, geez, this is what I do for a living. Preventive health, making sure that people are not getting sick, especially in the workplace, and by things that we're doing that can affect, you know, human health and the environment. To summarize it, in an attempt to debunk this conspiracy theory as I thought it was, I didn't debunk it. It literally changed my life. Um, like I said, this is hard for me because it's not easy standing here and telling my story. One day I was going through that computer system, which if you want to look it up, it's called an Air Force Form 3952. It is the approval of ha hazardous materials. I was finding tons and tons of large quantities of aluminum, barium, strontium in the forms of oxides and sulfates. And of course I knew that there's industrial processes you may not have heard of, but it's bead blasting, pneumatic sanding, shot peening. There is certain medias that's similar to that that is used. However, I had already accounted for that. I would sit and look at this computer system and say, this shop wants to order this paint. I'm going to tie it to a task. We had to know what was being used, why it was being used, tracking it cradle to grave on how we were going to dispose of it to be compliant with OSHA and the EPA. One of the legal requirements in approving these is looking at what used to be called a material safety data sheet. On that sheet, it's going to list the manufacturer. It's going to list some maybe acquired personal protective equipment that needs to be used or some ways to mitigate the exposures. These electronic MSDSs, did not have a manufacturer name. They were very vague. They almost looked to me like somebody had made it and scanned it into the system. So I asked the question, what is this being used for? I never got an answer, so I didn't approve it. And it sat there. And then the heat came down. Why aren't you, are you behind on your 3952s? Only a select few of us did that. So I started asking questions. And at that point, my demonization began. You know, I, I made my rank. I was decorated. I was a non-commissioned officer of the quarter. I won lots of awards. I had no reason for anyone to attempt to demonize me. 
So then I get moved over to the other air logistics center. There's only two in the Air Force, which is in Warner Robins, Georgia. This kind of carried with me, and I thought, you know what? Should I revisit this? Is it worth it? Did I hit something? Maybe it's need to know. I started finding the same things at Robbins Air Force Base. I was now doing some more investigation work. Part of what I did was to use a high volume air sampler to air sample um, up to, I'd say, a football field in about 10 minutes. I also conducted soil sampling because I thought, you know, if, if this is real and they are spraying this, it's going to get to the ground. So I conducted air sampling, I conducted soil sampling, and I was getting high levels of these contaminants. When I started asking the question again under a new commander, I never in my life thought I would have somebody look me in the face and tell me, I am questioning you. Is there something wrong with you? You've been looking really depressed lately. You know I can put you under a mental evaluation for a, up to 120 days. Who would take care of your daughter? Because I was divorced at the time. As soon as I heard that, I knew. It validated everything I ever thought.